Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a brief introduction. One of the defining issues of any culture, oopsie, one of the defining issues of any culture is how a society treats its most vulnerable. And we define the most vulnerable as the unborn, the newly born, the elderly, handicapped, people with special needs, the sick, and in this case, the terminally ill. So this is what the culture of life building or the pro-life movement is all about. As Catholics, Christians, and people of all faiths, we are cognizant of the fact that life is sacred because it was created by God, okay? And Jesus Christ took on human life. That made life sacred. God is the author of human life. He determines when it begins and when it ends. We realize that suffering and struggle are a part of life because of original sin. And we know that suffering can be redemptive. We look at the cross and we understand that the suffering of Jesus redeemed us all. But we live in a post-Christian culture. People hardly even believe in God, let alone practice any faith. The nuns, quote, are up to 23% by some accounts. Now, nuns are people who have been asked what their religion is, and they say, none. Okay, so that's up to 23%. And Catholics are down to 23%. Catholics who practice their faith. Some of these folks don't even want God spoken about in the public square. These are the people with whom we must contend. Our children must contend with them. They're the ones we have to convince. These are the politicians who think up such dreadful legislation. We have to convince them. These are the people we must convince that physician-assisted suicide and assisted suicide are grave moral evils. evils. And we can't use arguments that come solely from our faith. We must convince others by using reasoned arguments, logical persuasion, and undeniable facts. And to help us in this task, we have been blessed this evening to have a legislative and policy expert with us. Kathleen Gallagher is the um, pro-life activities coordinator or direct, director of pro-life activities at the Catholic Conference of New York. She's been with the Catholic Conference for over 36 years. It's based in Albany. She represents the state's Roman Catholic bishops in presenting the church's life-related policy positions to legislators, the media, and other groups statewide. She will analyze the current legislation, its numerous flaws, and most dangerous ramifications. She is a woman of faith, and she will present the reasoned, logical arguments against this bill to legalize physician-assisted suicide. Please welcome Mrs. Kathleen Gallagher. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out on a Tuesday night. I appreciate it. I hope that I can plant some seeds here tonight and educate you a little bit about this very serious issue. Um, I do like to start my presentations with a joke, but it doesn't seem quite appropriate because it's such a serious life and death issue. But I did find a slide that I can show you that might bring a chuckle. The four stages of life. Ready? Wait for it. <laughs> okay, I don't know about you, but I'm still in the third stage. <laughs> if you can't see the screen, I encourage you to come closer because this is the smallest screen I have ever seen in my entire life. Um, so you will want to see some of the words, I think. Okay, so what I'm going to do is start out with a little bit of the foundation of Catholic teaching. Where we come from as Catholics in looking at this issue of doctor-assisted suicide. So these are just basics, they're fundamentals, but it is the foundation for why we take a position of opposition to these kinds of proposals. So what does Catholic teaching tell us? Well, the most basic moral norm is Every human life is sacred because he or she is made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, they have intrinsic dignity, built in, inherent dignity. And a person never loses his or her dignity, no matter how sick, no matter how weak, no matter how voiceless or vulnerable a person might be, a person always has intrinsic dignity. Each man and woman, as Martha said, 
came from God, is made from God, and is destined to go back to God. Every single human life is deserving of our respect and deserving of the protection of our laws. That's why I do what I do at the state capitol in Albany, try to secure protection in law for the most vulnerable human lives among us. And finally, our faith says life is a gift. We don't really own it. <laughs> it belongs to God. We have stewardship over our life, but not ownership. In life and death, we belong to the Lord. Our faith also has something to say about suffering. The suffering of illness and dying, our faith teaches us, is an opportunity for grace-filled moments of redemption and bringing us in communion with Christ on the cross at Calvary. He suffered and died for us. He redeemed us. Our suffering is a way to share in his redemption. And anyone who's ever had a loved one close to you die, you know that those last moments at the bedside are often very special grace-filled moments where we can say, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or thank you, or I love you. Things perhaps we haven't been able to say throughout our lives. Now, that's not to say that we as Catholics want to make people suffer. <laughs> we don't. We want to be charitable. We want to treat our neighbor as we would like ourselves treated. And so, of course, we try to reduce, we try to eliminate as much suffering as we possibly can. Our faith also teaches us that there is a better life to come, that our ultimate destiny is not the hospital bed, it's not the funeral home, and it's not the cemetery plot. There may come a point in someone's illness where we have to accept the human condition with profound Christian hope in the life that is to come. We believe that death is a doorway to our ultimate destiny with God. And every week when we go to Mass, we pray the creed, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. The catechism of our church says, that those whose lives are diminished or weakened deserve our special respect. Not just respect, but we're supposed to give them special respect. The Catechism defines the word euthanasia for us and says euthanasia means putting an end to the lives of handicapped, sick, or dying persons. It is morally unacceptable. It is always wrong to cause the death of an innocent person. In 1980, the Vatican published a declaration on euthanasia, and they defined it for us. And here's how they defined it. Euthanasia is an action or an omission which of itself or by intention causes death in order that suffering, all suffering, may in this way be eliminated. The key words here, by intention. Intent is very important in Catholic teaching. So what is an action that might uh, qualify as, as euthanasia? If a doctor gives a lethal injection to a patient in order to stop his suffering, that's euthanasia. Uh, an action, an omission that might be euthanasia would be if a patient decides, I don't want to live like this anymore, I want to die, and instructs the hospital to remove his feeding tube. The intent is to die. That would be euthanasia. Palliative care, on the other hand, is all about respecting the dignity of the individual. 
There may come a time when someone has an illness, particularly a terminal illness, where they can't be cured and treatment has no benefit for them, right? This is where, as Catholics, we have to weigh the burdens against the benefits. And sometimes cure and treatment is not possible. So we try to make the patient as comfortable as we possibly can. That's palliative care. It consists of adequate pain medications, managing the symptoms, our compassion, our acceptance of the natural condition. It's, it's comprehensive care. It's physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological care. And it's also support for the patient's family. Um, I think there's a display over there, right, Martha, about total palliative care. There's a video that people can watch after this if they'd like to. Is it by the Carmelite Sisters for the aged and infirm? Yeah, so we, the Catholic Church, do a lot of good in the area of palliative care. But again, intention is critical. We can give pain medications to someone to relieve their suffering, to relieve their pain. And it might have the secondary effect of hastening the moment of death. But that's morally acceptable according to our faith. Our intention was never to kill them. Our intention is to reduce their suffering. Pope Francis says that palliative care is an expression of the truly human attitude of taking care of one another, especially those who suffer. So I also want to mention that I brought for you this booklet. If you haven't seen it, you should. I have copies up here for everyone. It's called Now and at the Hour of Our Death, A Catholic Guide to End of Life Decision Making. This was published by the Catholic Bishops of New York State, I think, originally in 2011, but it's all a blur. Um, but it's a really good booklet that much more substantively addresses all of the Catholic teachings I just went through really briefly. So it will go into more detail about Catholic teaching, and then it goes into what are the laws in New York State about advanced directives, healthcare proxies, living wills, all those kinds of things, and what you, as a Catholic, should be doing in that area. So it's a really beneficial, useful statement of the bishops. I commend it to you. Okay. So, now we're going to switch from, that's our Catholic foundation, that's our starting point, that's where we begin when we look at a piece of legislation that legalizes physician-assisted suicide. As Martha said, sometimes we don't want to use the Catholic arguments when we're trying to persuade other people about the wrongness of a policy like doctor-assisted suicide. In fact, I've looked at almost all the public opinion polls that are out there on this issue. The least persuasive voices in this debate, religious voices. The most persuasive voices are doctors and medical authorities and patients themselves, and also people with disabilities. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, so what is physician-assisted suicide? It's a piece of legislation that would make it lawful for a terminally ill patient with a prognosis of six months or less to live to request a lethal dose of drugs from a doctor, go to the pharmacy, fill that prescription, then take the drugs home to ingest them with the intention of causing death. You might remember this guy. Remember him? Yeah. He used to be the face of physician-assisted suicide. Remember him back in the early 90s, I think it was? Maybe even, yeah, it was early 90s. And he would drive around in this rusty old van and he had like these horrible suicide machines, the contraptions that he would put a mask over people's head to put them out of their misery. 
And he used to say, um, it's not just for people who are terminally ill. In fact, he bragged that he caused, helped cause the deaths of over 130 people. And he said not many of them had terminal diagnoses, but all of them were suffering, he said. Any kind of suffering could do. It could be emotional suffering. Um, so um, he was kind of, of, a, of a wild guy. <laughs> and he didn't have a very good reputation. He was ultimately charged and convicted of uh, manslaughter um, for helping someone commit a suicide. And he went to jail for, I think it was eight years, and then he was given parole, but that was shortly before he died in 2011. He didn't have a very positive public image. You know, he was kind of like this kooky professor kind of guy who used a weird contraption in the back of his rusty old van to help people kill themselves. So nobody really liked him. Unfortunately, today, there's a softer, gentler, more compassionate look for physician-assisted suicide. And that would be Brittany Maynard. Anybody here ever hear of her? Sure, I just need a drink, hang on. So Brittany Maynard was a beautiful, young, newlywed uh, who lived in the state of uh, California, who found herself with a diagnosis of glioblastoma, the most deadly form of brain cancer that there is. And she decided she wanted to avail herself of assisted suicide drugs, but it wasn't legal in her home state of California. So she and her husband and her mother traveled to Oregon and set up a residence there. Oregon was the first state in our country to legalize physician-assisted suicide. And she ultimately did get a prescription. She ultimately ingested those pills and killed herself in November of 2014. And before she did die, she made a series of videos to try to encourage states to legalize this practice because she felt it was her personal right, her personal freedom to be able to choose the time and manner of her death. So let's just look at the current laws. Currently there are seven states that have legalized doctor-assisted suicide. Oregon, Washington, Vermont, California, which did it a year, a year and a half after Brittany Maynard died because she had to go to Oregon. California did legalize it. Colorado, Hawaii, New Jersey just legalized it. That doesn't take effect until August 1st. And the District of Columbia, and very bad news today, uh, both houses in the state of Maine voted by one vote. The vote in the House was 73 to 72. Um, so both houses in the state of Maine legislature have voted this in. The governor of Maine, who is a female Democrat, has not said where she stands on the bill yet. So I'm sure there's a lot of furious lobbying going on, but um, it's happening, folks. It's a train, and it's coming at us fast. Um, supporters of these laws, um, oh, first let me tell you this. The majority of people who get those prescriptions and use them um, say that their top reasons for wanting those drugs are loss of autonomy and fear of being a burden on other people around them. Very few people who get the prescription say physical pain is an issue for them. It is primarily, I fear that I'm gonna lose the ability to do the things that I've always done. I don't wanna lose my, my autonomy, my freedom. I don't wanna lose my independence. I don't wanna be dependent on others. I don't wanna be a burden to others. We're gonna come back to that. Um, so supporters of these bills are working hard to bring it here to New York State. And they're doing it under the mantle of choice. It's all about choice. It's all about free choice. And if you look at advertising, just open up any newspaper, you will see choice is the word. You can choose your supermarket. You can have healthy choice meals for dinner. You can choose your tobacco. You can choose your cable company. 
The word choice is probably the most popular word in advertising today. And of course, we know my body, my choice. We've heard that before, eh? So there is a group that promotes physician-assisted suicide called the Final Exit Network. They put up this billboard in New Jersey. It says, my life, my death, my choice. That's their slogan. My life, my death, my choice. And in fact, the group that used to be called the Hemlock Society has now had a rebranding. And now they call themselves Compassion and Choices. Nice, soft, beautiful, positive sounding words. Who doesn't like compassion? And who doesn't want free choice? This is their website, Compassion and Choices. You'll see Brittany Maynard's wedding pictures are right on the front page of Compassion and Choices website. She became their new brand and actually quite successfully. I don't really buy the whole choice thing. Um, remember this guy, BC, the comic strip? Um, here he is looking in a dictionary, he's looking up the word birth, and he finds the definition, it says, the leading cause of death. <laughs> death is not a choice. We're all gonna die. It's a natural event. It's going to happen. I hate to break it to the supporters of this bill, but it's going to happen. Just give me a second, I'm really hot. Okay, okay, so here we are. So, the New York legislation has gone, um, has had a variety of name changes over the years. Um, we saw right after Brittany Maynard took her life in November of 2014, we knew this was coming to New York. We knew they would target us. So we started preparing and organizing and getting groups, other advocacy groups to join us in our opposition. Um, and um, so that was 2014, so that was five, almost six years ago. Um, and the bill has had a variety of different names. First they called it the Patient Self-Determination Act. Because who doesn't like self-determination, right? You want to have determine your own future. And then they changed it to the End of Life Options Act. Because it's just, you know, there's a range of end of life options. There's hospice, there's palliative care, you know, there's assisted suicide. <laughs> there's just a range. And then they didn't like those though, they went on. Um, then they called it Death with Dignity, which we still hear a lot. I noticed that a lot of the reporters who do the stories on this issue call it Death with Dignity. Um, which I find so offensive because it, it's almost implying that if you die a natural death in hospice, it's an undignified life, which is just so awful and offensive. But the name they've settled on here in New York is the Medical Aid in Dying Act. Medical Aid in Dying. It's simply medical assistance with dying. My very first advice to you, strong advice, don't ever use any of those titles when you're talking about this issue. When you're trying to talk to your coworkers or your friends or your kids or anybody to try to persuade them on this issue, to your legislators, don't use those names. They're bogus, they're false. We have to call it what it is. It is suicide and Doctors who write those prescriptions for those lethal drugs are assisting a suicide. Currently, New York state law says a person is guilty of manslaughter in the second degree if he intentionally causes or aids another person to commit suicide. Doesn't say it's just for doctors, doesn't say it's just for police officers or firemen or school teachers, anybody. A person is guilty of manslaughter if they assist someone to commit suicide. The supporters of doctor-assisted suicide say, that's a really good law and that should stay on the books. What they want is a carve-out 
from that law. Assisted suicide bills carve out an exception to this law. The bills actually state that the act is not to be considered suicide under the law. It is to be considered a treatment, a treatment option, medical assistance in dying. It is not to be considered suicide, say these bills. Let me tell you something. If I walk out of here tonight and I step into a pile of dog dirt, I can call it baked ziti if I want to, but that's not going to make it smell any better or be easier to get off my shoes. It's still going to be dog dirt. They can call it whatever they want. Suicide is suicide, and assisting someone to take their own life is suicide. Um, this is interesting. So I was reading an Associated Press story today about what happened in Maine when both houses passed this bill, and this is right in the Associated Press story. Quote, the bill declares that obtaining or administrating Life-ending medication is not suicide under state law in Maine. Still, comma, it effectively legalizes it. So the writers at Associated Press realize it's a hoax. Of course it's suicide. All of the courts in New York State, which have smacked down attempts to legalize physician-assisted suicide, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, the courts have said, the appellate division in New York State said, look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> look up the word suicide. Yes, this is suicide. Um, and also, I always remember very fondly, do any of you remember Monsignor Bill Smith from the Archdiocese? He taught at the seminary. He always said, all social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. Right? That's like so true in this case. Okay, so this guy, Dr. Timothy Quill, has tried to legalize physician-assisted suicide in this state for many years. He challenged our state law, which bans assisted suicide, numerous times. And all of the courts, including New York's highest court and the US Supreme Court, have said New York's law is constitutional. New York's law that, call, that says it's manslaughter to assist a suicide is constitutional, and there are real, reasonable, rational reasons for it. So the Court of Appeals, which is New York's highest court, um, their decision came in 2017, not that long ago, and our top court, by the way, packed with Cuomo appointees, all of the justices are Andrew Cuomo's appointees, unanimously they said, the legislature of this state has permissibly concluded that an absolute ban on assisted suicide is the most reliable, effective, administrable means of protecting against its dangers. Wow, that's really good. They did kind of throw the ball back to the legislature and say, if the legislature so concludes that they want to legalize it, of course they could, but they nonetheless said there's no constitutional right, there are no carve-outs, which is what Dr. Quill argued, there should be a carve-out. Um, the Constitution supports, does not support a right to assisted suicide. The U.S. Supreme Court, in the case known as Vacco versus Quill in the mid-90s, also unanimously upheld New York's law. This is kind of a long quote from the court's decision, but it's important because this gives us the best secular non-religious reasons, persuasive reasons, why we should ban doctor-assisted suicide. The U.S. Supreme Court said unanimously, New York's reasons, including prohibiting the intentional killing and preserving life, preventing suicide, maintaining physicians' role as their patients' healers, 
protecting vulnerable people from indifference, prejudice, psychological, and financial pressure to end their lives, and avoiding a possible slide towards euthanasia. These are valid and important public interests, said the US Supreme Court unanimously. Again, very positive decision for us. So let's go through those reasons that the court gave, because it'll give you your best arguments against legalizing doctor-assisted suicide. First of all, preventing suicide. Anybody who attempts suicide is crying out for help, right? They're likely depressed, and they need help and assistance. There is nothing in the legislation here in New York that requires a doctor to refer the patient to a counselor, to a clinical mental health worker, to get an assessment or a screening to even determine if they might be clinically depressed. I mean, if you get a diagnosis of a terminal condition and a six-month prognosis to live, I think I'd be depressed. Um, and perhaps there's medication or some other therapy that could help in treating that depression rather than going the way of lethal medication. Society recognizes suicide as a public health concern, and we send first responders when someone is attempting a suicide. New York State spends millions and millions of dollars on its suicide prevention efforts. They have curricula in the public school classrooms. They have training programs in the state prisons, as some of us probably know here, um, so that prison workers will recognize the symptoms, the risk factors for suicide. Um, we have signs on the bridges. I saw one on the way here today on the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge that says, life is worth living with a hotline number for suicide prevention. Hmm. It just seems rather inconsistent to say, your lives are worth living, yours over here, not so much. Um, the governor actually has a task force on suicide prevention. They just released their new report called Communities United for a Suicide-Free New York. And the governor, when he unveiled this in April of this year, said this, the report will help increase awareness and strengthen the safety net to protect anyone who needs help. Hmm. Maybe not everyone. Because actually, just the next month, the governor Cuomo said he supports physician-assisted suicide. So assisted suicide legislation undermines the consistent message that life is worth living. Persons with disabilities take great offense at physician-assisted suicide, and we have been able to partner with some of the advocacy groups for disability rights in this state to kind of beat this legislation back. And here's why they take great offense. They say, Assisted suicide sets up two different classes of people, those for whom society will prevent suicide and those for whom society will assist. Furthermore, they say, this double standard is based on health concerns. Remember the reasons that people choose these lethal drugs? Loss of autonomy, fear of being a burden are generally due to disabilities. Right? As a person with a terminal illness gets closer to death, that person is most likely less able to feed themselves, clothe themselves, go to the bathroom themselves. They need assistance with that kind of activity. Therefore, they are less abled. They are disabled. So people with disabilities say, that doesn't make our, our lives any less valuable. That doesn't make our quality of life any less just because we need some assistance in our daily lives. And they say it with such credibility. I have worked with such great people from the disability community. They say it's blatant discrimination, blatant discrimination based on disability. And they are very credible spokespeople. So just last week, 
we helped um, a bunch of the disability rights activists have a press conference at the state capitol. This is one of the news stories. Disability rights advocates strongly oppose assisted suicide practices. Um, and these are three of the people that we work with. One of them is legally blind. Two of them are in wheelchairs. They need assistance with some daily living. And they were just fabulous. So this is the kind of thing we're doing, trying to put those kind of spokespeople up front to show that this is not a good idea for New York. I'm going to pause here because you're probably tired of listening to me anyway and show you a very quick video. It's like three minutes, I think. And it's appropriate because it's a person with, disabili with disabilities. For a long time in my life, I was relegated to the sidelines. So I relish every opportunity that I have to step into life. Um, certainly presented its fair share of challenges. Um, at 10 years old, it was learning how to get my own pants on and being able to dress myself. At 16, it was learning how to drive a car. 21, moving away from family and going off to Texas for my first job. 32, getting married. 37, having a child. Every stage of life brings on all these sorts of challenges. We live in a world that all too often our self-worth is bound up in what we can do. Um, that our worth is tied to these tangible achievements. As a disabled person, um, I've been very tuned into this whole idea of independence. I don't need anybody's help um, getting dressed or be able to live in a home on my own and all of that. And, and, and yeah, I get that on a certain level. but. What, nobody is totally, ever completely in it, but none of us live on an island. We, we need each other. Um, I have learned in my life that a more integrated or, or peaceful or a life, um, I think one of really coming from wisdom is this whole idea of interdependence. I help you, you help me, and together we are more. Like cooking, for example, I love to cook, but I'm not good at, good at the, the cutting, the slicing, and chopping, and, and my wife, Christine, helps me with those things. Invariably, I'll need an ingredient that's on the top shelf in the cabinet, and my daughter, Faye Teresa, likes to, is willing to get up there and help me grab something. She literally becomes my arms in that. There you go. No, one more. Planning the meals, researching the recipes, the, the techniques of how something is done. I love cooking because it's, it's another art form. It's, 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 it's creating, not to mention I love to eat. People probably feel, fear many things about being disabled or getting sick or having a terminal illness. I, I mean, there's, there's just all kinds of fears there. But this whole notion of assisted suicide, it's almost like we sell all of ourselves short. We sell the person with the, 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 the condition, we sell their life short, we sell our ability to, to be compassionate, to grow. We sell that short too, but we can do better. We can do better to help alleviate those fears, to provide the care, to be there for each other. That's interdependence. Everybody has something in their life. And some of those conditions make us feel broken or incomplete, but all of us have them. And even in the midst of those conditions, every life is worth living. If you check out, how are you going to know what you gave up? You know, life is painful. Life is difficult. But a life also yields a lot of joy, a lot of opportunity to give and to be generous and um, to love and to be loved. And you only do that by having the courage to step into life.
Okay, there were some great things that he said in that video, some really great one-liners there about how his daughter literally becomes his hands, right? That's what we're called as Christians to do, to help each other to become their hands, their arms, their legs when they can't. We are all one body in Christ. Um, what else did he say that I've just found so beautiful? Oh, he said, we live in a society that tends to put more value on what we can do rather than just our being, you know? I always used to tell my kids, there's a reason you're called human beings and not human doings. Because <laughs> you are valuable and loved by God just because you be, just because you are, not because you do something that's gonna make you successful or valuable. All right, I'm doing good on time here, so we're gonna move along. Okay, so um, the next reason that the U.S. Supreme Court gave in upholding New York's ban was maintaining the physician's role as healer. Remember the Hippocratic Oath? <laughs> it says, first do no harm. It also used to say, I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked. A doctor friend of mine was recently at a medical school graduation where the back of the program had printed the physician's oath in the tradition of Hippocrates. And one of the lines in this oath struck me. It says, I will preserve my patient's confidentiality and respect my patient's choices. Kind of scary, kind of scary. But as of right now, the American Medical Association, which represents doctors in this country, is opposed to the legalization of physician-assisted suicide. They say, even though they call it aid in dying, which we will never call it, it's fundamentally incompatible with the role of physician as healer and would be difficult or impossible to control. Similarly, the Medical Society of the State of New York, which represents doctors here in our state, recently put out this statement. There are great disparities in access and quality of care at the end of life. We are particularly concerned about the impact of medical aid in dying, assisted suicide, on vulnerable populations. The Medical Society of the State of New York is opposed to physician-assisted suicide, but we continue to examine the issue through our task force on end-of-life care. There are forces within the Medical Society of the State of New York, as well as within the American Medical Association, who are trying to change their position from opposition to neutrality. Neutrality, really, come on. In California, besides the case of Brittany Maynard, it was the California Medical Association going neutral that really pushed the legislature to enact it because once the California Medical Society said we no longer oppose it, it almost gave the green light to lawmakers to go ahead and do it. So the bad news is there are forces within the medical societies all over trying to move them away from opposition. The good news is um, we've been working on this, as I said, since 2014, and we've got a good number of doctors in this state on our side, many of whom have now secured positions on committees within the Medical Society of the State of New York and within the American Medical Association. So they're also working on the inside to try to maintain the position of opposition. It's a fight every year, but so far we've been able to win on that one. When you go to your doctors, ask them. Ask them what they think about this. It's always an interesting thing to ask your own physicians how they feel about these issues. Um, another reason the U.S. Supreme Court gave, protecting the vulnerable. In Oregon, first state to legalize this, the statistics show that the people most often who get the prescriptions are elderly, isolated, low income, and they're never ever screened for clinical depression. 
They will be pressured, those people, by a lot of outside forces to choose death over life. They will be pressured by insurance companies. We've already seen in Oregon and Washington State, insurance companies will definitely cover the lethal medications, but a lot of times they won't cover that very expensive chemotherapy or immunotherapy that the patient needs. That's a pressure. There are pressures by doctors who sometimes subtly and sometimes not so subtly make value judgments about which patients' lives are worth living and which are not. There are pressures by family members, sometimes good intentioned family members, sometimes not good intentioned family members, who are tired and overworked and overburdened by taking care of their loved one. So there's all these outside pressures on patients to choose to die. It will be a method of cost containment over in healthcare rationing. We've already seen that happen in Oregon and Washington. But I just want to one more time highlight that second bullet. I think it's one of our strongest arguments because our opponents are pushing this on choice. It's a free choice. We have to show that it's not really a free choice when death is so much cheaper <laughs> and when death is being pushed on people. There's no safeguards in this legislation for when the patient takes those pills home. I mean, what's to say that a family member who is feeling overtaxed and overburdened won't crumble those pills up in the morning oatmeal? Like, we don't know. Um, in fact, the bill requires two witnesses um, to be there when the patient makes the request of their doctor for the lethal drugs. And the legislation says one of those two witnesses can be somebody who stands to get an inheritance from the patient in their will. Okay, and then that patient maybe, that person maybe lives in the home when the drugs come into the home. It's just, I think, opening up a Pandora's box of problems. You remember this guy, the first Governor Cuomo? He had a New York State Task Force on Life and the Law. And in 1994, his task force unanimously rejected physician-assisted suicide. I need my glasses to read this. Here's one thing, one thing the task force said. No matter how carefully any guidelines are framed, assisted suicide will be practiced through the prism of social inequality and bias that characterizes the delivery of services in all segments of our society, including health care. The practices will pose the greatest risks to those who are poor, elderly, members of a minority group, or those without access to good medical care. The growing concern about health care costs only increases the risks presented by legalizing assisted suicide. That was the first Cuomo. The second Cuomo recently said, as I mentioned earlier, on a radio program in April, he was asked directly about this piece of legislation, and this was the first time he ever said what he thought about it. He didn't give it a full-throated, yeah, let's go do that, but he kind of just threw it back at the legislature and said, I say pass the bill. If you support it, pass the bill. It's a controversial issue, it's a difficult issue, but the older we get and the better medicine gets, the more we've seen people suffer for too, too long. I would urge him to take a look at his latest report from the Suicide Prevention Task Force because all of the populations that he's trying to stop suicide for, the young teenagers who are being bullied, the inmates who are sentenced to a life in prison, um, all of those, they're all suffering, right? They're all suffering. Um, so why isn't suicide good for them, but it's good for the terminally ill? Just seems very inconsistent to me. Um, the governor did say about a month later, he didn't think that this would be the legislative session to pass this, 
because it's probably a too heavy a lift because there's only 10 days left now in the legislative session and he doesn't think it can get done. I am cautiously optimistic that it will not get passed this year. In fact, we're pretty certain that we've tied up the votes in the health committee of both houses so it couldn't get out anyway. But, you know, those things can change in a heartbeat. Okay, I think it's the last reason from the Supreme Court. They said there's a slippery slope that we want to avoid. And I know that's an overused term, but it's so perfect here. Um, because if you look at other countries like Belgium and the Netherlands, first they approved euthanasia for people who are terminal, and then it went to people who are non-terminal. First they approved it for people who are competent, and then they said, well, even people who don't have capacity to make decisions, their healthcare proxy should be able to make this decision for them. So we've seen the slippery slope in action. In Oregon, the first state to legalize this for terminally ill patients with a six-month prognosis, they're now looking at legalizing it for patients with a 12-month terminal diagnosis. So you can see that there really, truly is a slippery slope. And I think there was an awful report. I just saw a headline today on Facebook about a 17-year-old girl in another country where, I think it might have been the Netherlands, where, um, anybody see that? She, she, she killed herself. She, she chose euthanasia because it's legal in the country where she was. She said she had been raped as a child and she couldn't live with the depression and the trauma that she faced every single day in getting up. So she availed herself of the legal euthanasia um, and committed suicide in that country today. It's an awful story. It'll probably be in your newspaper tomorrow. Um, okay, so those are all the arguments from the U.S. Supreme Court. There are also lots and lots and lots of problems with the legislation. Um, I won't go through them all with you. I did mention a few of them already. Um, there is no psychological counseling provided. There is no screening for depression and no treatment for any kind of mental ailment that the patient may have. Um, the only time the patient has to be referred to a psychologist is to determine if they have capacity to make this decision or not. Um, the bills require that the doctors lie on the death certificates. They must put down as the cause of death the underlying terminal illness and not the lethal drugs that the patient took. In any other area of medicine, would that not be malpractice? <laughs> it's just absurd. Um, but that's what the bills say. There's no transparency or accountability. There's nothing that requires our state health commissioner, for example, to keep track of the number of patients who are requesting the drugs, the number of patients who actually use the drugs. There's just no way to tell if there are any abuses going on. It's the same with Oregon and Washington State. Um, the people who are supporting this legislation, I've heard them say a million times, there are absolutely no abuses taking place in the states that have legalized this. To which I say, how could you possibly know that? We don't know what happens when those drugs go to the home. We have no idea what happens to those drugs, which is another scary thing, isn't it? Our legislature is tripping over itself trying to crack down on the opioid epidemic, right? And now they're going to allow lethal doses of drugs to go into the home in the medicine cabinet. The patient could leave it there for, I don't know, a year, two years. What if there are young people in the house that get their hands on those drugs? We know they're lethal. It's just absurd. Um, again, there's no safeguards at the time of ingestion, and there are really insufficient conscience protections for medical providers who don't want to do this, and for religious hospitals like Catholic hospitals who wouldn't want to allow this on their premises. Um, like, for example, there's a provision in the bill that says, a Catholic hospital could stop a physician from writing a lethal prescription on the hospital grounds, but it doesn't say that that physician couldn't 
provide physician-assisted suicide in a range of options or counsel for it or even refer to another doctor down the street. So there's some problems with conscience protections in the bill as well. So what do we support? Well, instead of medical aid in dying, we support aid in living. And I think that's what we have to really promote. Um, New York State ranks dead last. 49th, well not dead last, almost dead last, 49th in the country of any state for the utilization of hospice. I say to legislators all the time, why is that? Shouldn't you as lawmakers be trying to find out? There must be some obstacles getting in the way of patients accessing hospice if, there's only, if we're 49th in the nation for the utilization of hospice. Maybe it's an economic thing, a monetary barrier. I don't know what it is. But I think it's our legislature's responsibility to find out why and to improve access to good hospice care, improve education in pain management. I have spoken to some physicians at Calvary Hospital in the Bronx, which is a specialty hospital for advanced cancer patients. They tell me that literally 99% of all physical pain can now be controlled with, with the different kinds of pumps and pills and all kinds of patches that they have. Um, pain, physical pain, can be controlled. We have to require medical education in pain management, pain symptom management, pain control. We need greater access to palliative care. I encourage you to pick up some documents over at that table. Pope Francis says we need to accompany patients, not abandon them. We need to be merciful to them. This is our website, if you've never seen it. It's got a wealth of information on it about this issue and a whole bunch of other issues. Um, NYScatholic.org. It's on the back of this, so you'll never forget it. Make sure you pick one of these up. It's also in the handout Martha gave you. Um, there's a tab on our homepage called Take Action. Take action. And when you pull down that tab, there's a lot of things that you can do. You can find our latest action alerts. You can find out who your state senator and assembly person is if you don't know. I'm assuming this is a pretty educated crowd here. Um, I believe the state senator here is Sue Serino. Is that right? And Dee Dee Barrett is the assemblywoman, at least for this particular address right here. Um, well, I'm happy to say that a lawmaker's position on physician-assisted suicide doesn't neatly cut um, Republican Democratic lines. We had a vote on this bill only once in New York State, and it was an Assembly Health Committee vote. And the bill did make it out of committee, that's as far as it went, but we got five Democrats in the Assembly on the Health Committee to vote no. Five. Four of them self-described pro-choice Democrats who voted no. And I have to tell you, that's mostly because of the disability community and the medical community. Um, their arguments are very, very persuasive. So if you go to the latest action alerts, you'll find a letter, opposed doctor-assisted suicide. It's a letter already written to your elected representatives. You can edit it if you wish. Always a good idea to put something in your own words. Um, but then when you put in your mailing address, your home address, it will automatically send it to your state senator and your state assembly representative based on your home address. It's a very easy, and efficient means of contacting lawmakers. I used to do things like this in the parishes like 15, 20 years ago, and I would bring envelopes and loose leaf and stamps, <laughs> and I would make people write letters to their legislator. <laughs> it's so much easier now. A few minutes of your time, a few clicks of your mouse, it's so easy, and it's so important, so important. Um, there's also a tab to contact your local media. You'll get a drop-down menu, and then you can check off the Poughkeepsie Journal or the Daily Freeman, and then hit down there at the bottom, Compose Message, and you can send a letter to the editor right through our website. 
It's never going to say New York State Catholic Conference on it. It's just going to have your name and address and your letter. Again, it's very efficient. I'm a big fan of letters to the editor because you never know where you can plant a seed out there. And, and I have to tell you, legislators, they get the pulse of their constituents, the pulse of the people, by reading or their staff reading the letters to the editor. They want to know how people feel about these critical issues of the day. So I totally encourage you to write letters to the editor. Just pick one issue that I talked about tonight, the prevention of suicide or maintaining the doctor's role as a healer. Just one issue, a simple two paragraph letter, and you never know where you can plant a seed. We also have a page of resources on our website, um, all about physician-assisted suicide. Two of the flyers, um, one's a flyer, one's a bulletin insert that you were handed today by Martha, uh, came from our website. Um, so there's good videos there, there's good resources. Um, there's another website called No Suicide NY. This is um, the New York Alliance Against Assisted Suicide. We helped put this together um, because we knew that religious voices were not really being listened to. So we have patient advocates, advocates for the elderly, we have disability rights advocates, all in this alliance, and we keep this website really up to date with the latest news and information. We also have a Facebook page for the New York Alliance Against Assisted Suicide. I'm guessing Martha put that on the handout as well. Um, so it's all there for you. The last thing I wanted to mention is this website, catholicendoflife.org. I'm really proud of this because what this is, we took the New York State Bishop statement about end of life decision making for Catholics and we turned it into a website. And we got a grant to do it. Um, and we made it eight, uh, I think, how long is the video? I think it's may, under 10 minutes where you see in the middle there it says watch video. It's a 10 minute video. Um, where we interviewed doctors and a Dominican priest and the Rosary Hill sisters about palliative care, um, about weighing burdens and benefits and how we're supposed to do that as Catholics at the end of life. Um, and then you can actually click on the map and see in other states, here's the resources in other states. So if you have a house in Florida and a house in California, you want to know what the laws and the, state and the bishops, what they say out there, it's all there for around the country. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there. And Martha's going to open this up to questions. Thank you so much for being a good audience. That was a long time. Yeah, um, the petition is the least effective means um, of affecting lawmakers' decisions. Um, it used to be that a paper letter, a paper individualized letter, was the most effective means because there was actually a pile on somebody's desk in the senator's office and it had to be dealt with. But now everything is pretty much email, like every, every communication they get. Nobody's faxing anymore and rarely are people sending letters. So um, I would say a personal email is the best. So the best way would be to take our letter and modify it to put it somewhat in your own words and then send that via email through our website. Because the legislator's staff will keep track and they'll say, we have five people in support of this, we have seven people opposed to this in our district. Because all they care about is the people in their district, right? At the end of the day, it's all about getting reelected. So, you know, Kathy Gallagher can go talk to Senator Serena. Well, she's not a good example. Dee Dee Barrett, I don't know where she stands on physician-assisted suicide. I'm thinking she might be gettable. Um, but I can go talk to her till I'm blue in the face, but at the end of the day, she knows I don't sleep in her district. 
So she doesn't really care what I think. She cares what you think because you're the people that go to the voting booth on election day. Anyway, the answer is personal letter in your own words. Most effective. Have you ever heard of the Patients' Rights Council? Patients rights Council? Yes, read a marker. And you, yes, do you uh, work with her? Not really, because we work more with the Patients' Rights Action Fund, um, and that's because of J.J. Hansen, who was a New Yorker. Has anybody ever heard of J.J. Hansen? Oh my gosh, I have another three-minute video I have to show you. Sorry, I don't mean to get off track, but um, J.J. Hansen was a New Yorker from Sullivan County, um, approximately the same age as Brittany Maynard, found himself with the same glioblastoma brain cancer diagnosis that she had, was given six months to live, and lived for three and a half years, and joined us in this fight. So he really linked us up with the Patients' Rights Action Fund, which is why we work so closely with them. We do get the newsletter and other information from Rita Marker and her side, Jason. Um, I would like to show this video of J.J. Hansen because it's so powerful. Um, one other thing. So this is a completely different issue. The governor in our state is now pushing to legalize surrogate motherhood for profit in New York State. And he's really pushing hard. There's only 10 more days in session. Um, and it's a terrible bill. It has some awful language in it about the unborn child. Um, but it's also, it's baby selling. It legalizes baby selling. And baby brokers are going to get a lot of money. Um, and it also exploits poor women. Because it's going to be poor women who are bearing children for rich couples. It's not going to be rich women who are bearing couples for poor people. Because it's going to cost $100,000 to get a baby. Anyway, it's a terrible bill. There's a group of lawmakers, Democrats, pro-choice women, who are strongly against it because they feel it's the exploitation, rightly so, the exploitation of, of women, especially economically disadvantaged women. And, it, it, and it's, there's so many loopholes in the bill it will allow trafficking of these women and trafficking of babies. There's no residency requirement in the bill. So somebody from another country can come to New York, buy a baby, and leave with that baby. What? I mean, it's just such a dangerous bill. But anyway, Dee Dee Barrett, again, has not said her position on this bill. I think because there are so many, mem not so many, there's a, there's a strong group of female members of the assembly where Dee Dee sits um, who have come out against this and have really strong concerns. I think she could be persuaded to go our way. So it is probably going to be voted on in the next 10 days. So if anybody, there is a letter up on our website about commercial surrogacy you can send through our action center, same place I showed you. But really, if you, if you feel it in your bones to call her office and just say, I'm your constituent and I oppose the bill on surrogate motherhood. The bill number, you ready? It's A. 1071A, uh, B. A, 1071B. Yes? I'm kind of curious, are the people who are supporting this, are they, are they saying anything about it'll cut down on abortion? No, I haven't heard that. The governor on Friday had a press conference to push for this, and he framed it as a gay rights issue that gay couples, they're now allowed to marry in New York, so of course they should be able to build families, and because they can't build families the natural way, they need this way, they, they need to buy babies. Um, so it's really being pushed as a gay issue. Um, but again, there's this core group of feminists in the assembly, pro-choice, self-described feminists, who are against this, and I think they could pull Dee Dee their, her, their way especially if they hear from some of their constituents that we don't want this to happen. So thank you for that. I'm going to just play this last video and I'll be done, I promise. Sick. And my dad's response would be, you can't hurt steel. That's JJ. I was very active growing up, did a lot of sports, played football. Uh, my family has a long line of military service, uh, specifically the Marine Corps. While I was in the Marine Corps, I got married to my wife, Chris. Life 
couldn't have been more perfect. We had just had James, he was one years old, we had moved to Florida. JJ had a job that he absolutely loved. We were living what people would consider as the American dream. In May of 2014, I started to feel what felt like a very deep anxiety attack. And I knew something was, was wrong with me because it just kept getting worse. And at that point, my ability to speak began to go away. My phone rang and I saw it was JJ's number on my caller ID. And I answered it and a woman's voice was on the phone. She was a paramedic. She was with JJ. He had had a grand mal seizure. They started doing tests. They weren't going to do an MRI initially. However, my wife, Chris, pushed them very heavily to do an MRI. The neurologist came back in and looked at us. And I'll never forget the look on his face when he told us, you have two lesions in your left temporal lobe. Grade four glioblastoma multiform, which is uh, one of the, if not the deadliest form of brain cancer that exists. The neurosurgeon who conducted the biopsy said that the, the cancer was inoperable. You have four months to live. In a best case scenario, you may get a year. And that was it, he walked away. When a week, week before that, you were running, you were having fun, you were hanging out with your kid and your wife, you were working and everything seemed fine. And all of a sudden, a man comes in and says, you're gonna die. You don't just accept it because someone said it. We had one doctor that told us that, go home, enjoy the time you have left. And yet another doctor said, we got this, no problem, we'll get it out. He had the surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering and he had an amazing neurosurgeon. They monitored to see if he was having seizures that we just couldn't see. Over the next 24 hours, he had nine more seizures. So by the time that was done, he couldn't talk at all. Would this be easier if I just gave up? If I just said, this is too much of a burden on my family, the pain is difficult, I don't want to deal with this. What if I just said I had enough and ended it? I would be okay the next day because I would be gone. I wouldn't feel the pain, I wouldn't feel the emotion. They do. My wife would feel it for the rest of her life. My son would not have one more day to spend with me. No matter how bad those days were, we had to fight for James. James makes us stronger. I still have cancer today. I still have active cancer cells. I, I'm still on chemo. And I have people say all the time, you don't look like it. You don't look like you have active cancer. It's because every single part of my day, I spend towards improving my ability to live. I followed the, the Brittany Maynard case. To a certain extent, I could identify with what she was dealing with. Same disease, roughly the same age, both had families, but I don't agree with what she chose to do. You can't unmake that choice. Once, once you do it, it's done. Unless a cure is found, the disease will come back. When and how, I don't know. My hope and my fight is to keep it at bay for as long as possible. I'd say my biggest fear with assisted suicide is that a patient will go to a doctor who already views them as a terminal patient and sees little hope for anything else, any other treatment options, any other um, outcomes other than death. Chris has saved my life. And she did that while being a mother, while paying the bills. I didn't have to ask for it. I didn't have to need it. She did it because she loved me. And she's my best friend. And I couldn't imagine being with anybody else besides her. You are more my hero now than I ever thought possible. And I love you and you're my best friend. Every single day is a gift, and you can't let that go. JJ was an incredible human being, not to mention a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat who worked for Governor Spitzer and Governor Patterson. 
Um, and he used to come to Albany <clears throat> after the first surgery and lobby with us, and he was just phenomenal. Um, the cancer did come back. He had a second operation to get rid of more tumors at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he still lobbied after that. Um, and now, as I said, uh, that he's passed away. He did have a second son. He had, they had a second son together in that three and a half year period that he was told he wasn't even gonna live for. They have, so Chris now has two little boys, um, but she's carrying the torch forward so beautifully and strongly and with such grace and patience there. I think, I think that JJ may be sainted one day. <laughs> it was a real honor and privilege to know him. I don't think there's any more questions, but I want to thank you so much, Kathleen, for making the effort to come down here on such a short notice. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you.